Well, good morning, everyone. Time to get started with our class uh, this morning. It looks like we're missing a bunch of folks. Uh, Rest assured, our ladies' class is uh, back there packed. And uh, Anyhow, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Let's begin uh, with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come entering your presence with thanksgiving, with joy in our hearts, with with minds that have come here today to, to focus upon you, your word, with the intent of taking these things and putting them into our lives in a, in a, in a da- on a daily basis, in each and every moment, striving to create and form those, those habits that, that help us not only grow, but help us bring others to a fullness of faith. Heavenly Father, we ask that you you be with us as we strive to do so, as we strive to not only grow ourselves, but to extend the borders of your, your kingdom and help folks uh, truly understand that uh, indeed you have built this kingdom, that, that there is one who calls us to his authority, his goodness, his kindness, his compassion, so that we may have the fullness of the life uh, that you designed for us here and now. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, as we study it, we, we, we understand that there are many, many skeptics, many detractors, and there have been throughout many ages. And we know that your word stands, and we know that at each and every turn, it has been victorious and, and likewise has not gone out and been unprofitable. Heavenly Father, let us have a resolve in our hearts to stand upon your word to know of its inerrancy, to teach it. Heavenly Father, let us be mindful of those who who do have questions, who who do seek understanding. Let us always be ready to give an answer to those who are are wondering about your word and how it is put together and the problems that uh, they see in it. May we give them enlightenment and may we Show them the path that you have set for us. Heavenly Father, all these things we pray in your Son's most holy name. And amen. All right. Last week we watched the video about, uh, well, essentially the inerrancy of the Bible. Uh, In other words, uh, the Bible doesn't make errors. The Bible doesn't have uh, errors uh, in it or is free uh, of errors. And mainly we talked about the contradictions within uh, Scripture. And we brought it up kind of at this point uh, in our study because, well... People don't go too far into the Bible and read it, and uh, if they are predisposed to the notion uh, that, uh, you know, well, the Bible is just kind of this old book that you can't trust, uh, then they're going to find things like this, and then typically it's at this point uh, that we start bringing this up near the end of Genesis. We've gone through the creation account. We've looked at Noah and the flood. We've considered a number of different things that uh, God has set forth in that opening book, uh, and uh, people... Start making their lists. Uh, Start making their list uh, of things that they find that are uh, perhaps uh, difficult, uh, and yet uh, they perceive as, you know, undermining the entirety uh, of the Bible, uh, kind of breaking the, the, you know, foundation, uh, which, uh, of course, is simply not uh, the case. Uh, Throughout uh, many, many years, people have uh, asserted many things, like the ones you heard last uh, week, like some of the ones that we'll bring up uh, this week, uh, and uh, at each and every turn, those things are refuted, uh, and uh, the Bible, again, uh, you know, comes out uh, when the smoke clears uh, as being not only from God, uh, but uh, is free of, you know, error. Uh, now, there are a couple of things I did want to go over uh, that uh, perhaps, um, you know, we just simply didn't have time. They didn't have time in the video to, to mention. Uh, and um, wanted to make sure that we mentioned as we went forward in our study, Uh, So that there is kind of a fullness uh, of uh, understanding when it comes to uh, the idea of factual errors or contradictions within Scripture. Uh, I think uh, the video gave a pretty good description of, you know, what makes for uh, a contradiction. Uh, You know, not everything that uh, everybody tells you is a contradiction uh, is actually a contradiction. Uh, In order to have uh, a contradiction, you have to have what? Does anybody remember? What do we have to have in order to have a contradiction? Well, you have to have statements that are basically in opposition uh, to one another 
uh, about the same thing or person, uh, given in the same you know, sense, uh, and they have to refer to the same time period. Uh, you know, so those are basically the three tests that we put uh, to contradictions. I mean, is it talking about the same thing? You know, there are two arcs uh, that are mentioned you know, with uh, you know, relative ease of understanding within Scripture, um, and they're two totally different things. We have the Ark of the Covenant, we have Noah's uh, Ark. Uh, so there's uh, you know, an example of, you know, same word, two different uh, meanings. Uh, but if you're talking about, uh, you, you know, um, you're talking about uh, the same thing, uh, you could be talking about it at two different times, and therefore information about those things uh, are different. Or you could simply be talking about it in two different, you know, senses. Uh, you know, one uh, perhaps being literal, like the ark uh, and the flood and, you know, Noah's day. Uh, and then over in the New Testament, when Peter refers to that same set of events, he uses it more of a, as more of a metaphor or a prefiguring uh, for baptism uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse, you know, 21. Uh, so we have two different senses being used there. Uh, is there a contradiction? Well, no, of course not. Uh, so we have those three tests. Uh, but that, that's, not, um, uh, that's not the whole uh, of all of the charges that are typically brought against uh, the Bible. Sometimes, sometimes uh, people, when they doubt Scripture, they just bring out um, discrepancies uh, between what they perceive as reality uh, and what the Bible actually, you know, says. Uh, sometimes uh, they take, uh, you know, uh, they, they take uh, just the facts of the Bible uh, and uh, inject uh, kind of the notion of, of doubt uh, about those things. For instance, um, you read along in the Bible uh, and you come across the name uh, of the people, the Hittites, and most of you probably remember this. Um, the Hittites were basically said uh, to be a made-up people. You know, the Bible just kind of made these folks up because we have, you know, no evidence that these people, you know, ever existed. And, and sure enough, for, for a long time, we, we had no evidence. Uh, there was no, uh, there were no artifacts, there were no writings, there were no, you know, uh, kind of uh, antiquities that would point us to uh, the fact that these people uh, existed until, you know, archaeologists uh, somewhere around, you know, what we call Turkey, uh, Asia Minor uh, found some writings, found some inscriptions that do mention the Hittite uh, people. Uh, so sometimes we take, you know, that kind of reality and compare it to, you know, the Bible or the absence of reality, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and we say that, well, see, the Bible is an error. We can't trust it, so on and so forth. Uh, there are a number of different things that people, um, you know, try to bring up when it comes to undermining uh, the case for the scripture. But as we said last week, uh, the case for the inspiration of the Bible, uh, that is the fact that God breathed it, uh, is rock solid. Uh, we've already had a lesson about that, so we're not going to really go, you know, into it. Um, the idea that the Bible is inerrant uh, also uh, is, you know, rock solid, but we do need to understand that concept uh, a, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more. Um, when we talk about inerrancy, uh, we're talking about <clears throat> Uh, essentially, uh, the documents or the writing of Scripture as God, you know, gave it, uh, which is going to pose a few problems, you know, for us. Uh, you know, for instance, if we can find manuscripts that date back to, you know, the first century and sometimes uh, even documents that are before uh, then, all of those documents that we have, you know, are, are copies, uh, are copies. And then we take that manuscript evidence uh, and uh, because we know languages and we know them well, we, we translate them into a version of the Bible uh, in our own language. Now, what do you think are the odds of us making some errors uh, in that translation? Probably pretty good, right? I mean, there are going to be a number of things that we have to consider. Uh, there are going to be a number of things that we have to, to realize, because at this point, um, we have a promise of inerrancy and we have a promise of inspiration uh, for those things as they were given by God. But if you're talking about somebody making a copy of the Bible uh, or doing a translation of, of the Bible, um, you've got to realize that, you know, like any document that we would produce, uh, it, it's going to have 
uh, it's going to have a, a certain margin uh, of, of error. And, and, you know, we find that. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, there are literally thousands uh, of errors uh, in translations as they've occurred over the years. Uh, most of those are just kind of misplaced punctuation, um, you, you know, uh, names spelled uh, incorrectly, uh, slips of the pen uh, account for about 99% uh, of all of uh, the mistakes that we can find in, in the manuscript evidence. And when you compare all of the 23,000 different documents and pieces and fragments that we have, that's exactly what you find. Uh, you, you find that since man has been making copies uh, of God's word uh, as he originally gave it, uh, there have been these small uh, little slips of the pen that are, are easily discernible. You ever see that thing that's passed around on the internet where they'll misspell words on purpose, uh, not put any punctuation in, but you can still read the sentence? You ever see that? You ever get that email? Yeah, they, they purposely misspell things. Um, don't put the punctuation in, forget to capitalize things. It's grammatically just horrible, but you can still read the sentence. Um, it's the same thing here. It, you know, we're not talking about mistakes that radically change the scripture. As a matter of fact, uh, when, um, <clears throat> when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, uh, they compared them to what uh, they already had. Uh, all of the documents and things that they already had, and what they found was that there was like a 98% uh, agreement uh, between all of them and the the differences were these slips uh, of the pen the copyist uh, error you, you know instead of uh, you know spelling um, uh, Micaiah's name uh, you know M-A-C-A-I-A-H uh, they would put in two A's uh, instead of A-I uh, and um, there were just small little errors like that um, so what we got to realize is there's a difference uh, be it perhaps, uh, you know, slight uh, as we consider it, uh, but yet important uh, on the other hand. Uh, there is a difference between God's word being delivered by these, you know, ancient, uh, you know, men <clears throat> who were driven by the Spirit and uh, a English translation of the Bible that we would pick up and read uh, today. Uh, so I'm going to point out just a couple of things about uh, that particular area uh, and then... Uh, sort of throw it open to, to the class and maybe your uh, input and your insights with regard to, you know, some of these uh, things, all right? Uh, the first thing that we, I kind of want to address is, is the notion of presuppositional uh, discrepancies, um, presuppositional discrepancies, and, and all this it means is that when you go to the Bible and you read it, uh, you go to the Bible and you read it, if you're looking to find, uh, if you're looking to find errors, Anytime there's something that would cause you to pause or question, um, you're going to immediately gravitate towards, you, you know, the contradiction, or you're going to immediately gravitate towards the, well, see, this is an, this is an issue of fact. Uh, instead of actually looking for uh, a way to resolve uh, that problem. You, you know, it's uh, kind of like uh, some folks do when problems come up in life. You, you know, they just react. Uh, they react and they get angry, and they get this, and they get that, and they never really get around to solving the problem. Uh, people do the same thing with Scripture. When they come up against something that is perhaps difficult, for instance, you take the harmonization uh, of uh, what we talked about last week when it came to, you know, the rooster crowing. Uh, we, we read over in this account, this account says something different, uh, and uh, oh, see, contradiction. You know, we immediately gravitate to that because we are predisposed uh, to the idea that the Bible is uh, or has these, you know, contradictions, these contradictions. Uh, this would also include the idea of us reading into Scripture things that uh, are simply not part of Scripture, uh, and yet they are assumed by us to be uh, part of Scripture. Um, most of us have probably heard a lot of things that uh, people have attributed to, you know, the Bible, uh, and... <clears throat> They're just not there. Uh, they're just not there. Uh, some of them are a little bit more nefarious than you know, others, uh, but most of them are relatively you know, benign. Uh, but we have a whole list uh, or hosts of sayings um, that just aren't really part of Scripture. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you, you know, if we want to get really, really nitpicky, e even some of the songs that, that we sing in the midst of our worship present to us more of a kind of poetic license view of scripture. 
Uh, you know, for instance, and I guess the one that I always think of is, you know, the cross became so heavy that he fell beneath the load. The Bible ever said Christ fell down? We assume that, right? And it's not bad to, to assume that. But as far as the facts go, the Bible never says that. It just says that he needed help. Uh, he needed help. Uh, and they compelled, uh, you know, an individual to come uh, and, and help him. Uh, and there are other things too. Uh, but, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. It, you know, is one of those ones that people assume is in, you know, Scripture. It's just not there. Uh, and there are a whole list of other things. So people, when they read the Scripture, you know, they read along, uh, and they have this kind of philosophical or call it theological bent uh, that, um, you know, they've been taught because they just simply don't have a depth of teaching. Uh, and they find something that's contrary to what, you know, they believe, and they say, well, you know, here's a contradiction. Uh, when in reality, they've never read the context uh, of uh, the Bible as a whole, whether remote or, or immediate context. Uh, they're just simply using their own kind of backdrop uh, in spiritual teaching uh, as a sort of context uh, in and of itself um, to provide uh, for them the supposed alleged uh, discrepancy or, you know, cont, uh, contradiction. Uh, and those are just a few of the things. But um, more importantly, are, are translational uh, errors. Uh, no translation is perfect. Uh, I mean... You know, a lot of people really, really love uh, the King James Version. Uh, a lot of people, you know, really, really love the American Standard Version of 1901. Uh, a lot of people like, uh, you know, well, insert whatever version it is you like. And if you like it, you know, that's great. Uh, but there's no version or no translation of the Bible uh, that is free from, uh, you know, some kind of error. Now, are those errors, when we say error, are we saying that, you know, uh, these things are wrong and sinful? No, we're not saying that at all. Uh, we're just saying that it is a translation that is done by men, uh, and, and there is a chance that things are, <clears throat> you know, things are not exactly uh, rendered in the best way possible. Um, most of the time, they are. Uh, but sometimes you, you have, you know, these translations that in the very least are, you know, difficult, uh, difficult. Uh, I don't think it's in this latest revision, um, and, and we, most people don't realize that most of the Bibles you have go through lots of revisions. Uh, for instance, the King James of 1611 is not the King James that you're reading today. Uh, it's gone through no less than, I believe, eight revisions uh, through the course uh, of the year because they, well, Primarily because the English language changes. Uh, and uh, the English that we speak today is very different than the English they spoke. Um, pick up some Shakespeare uh, and you read that language uh, and you'll realize pretty quickly uh, that it, it's borderline foreign to us uh, because of the way that you know, they use the English language. It's very, very different. Uh, but that's about the same type of language that the 1611 translators would have used uh, in order to translate uh, the Bible. So there are these words uh, that since that time uh, have changed their meaning, uh, have changed their meaning. Uh, so we have to go back and we have to revise uh, so that the people of this generation who are currently buying Bibles and are currently seeking understanding uh, can actually go there and act, make sense of it, uh, make sense of it. Uh, because English is a living language, we have to constantly um, update our dictionaries, update, you know, things like that. Well, the Bible's really no different. Uh, and as long as English remains a living language, that will always, you know, have to be uh, the case. So there are these translational uh, errors that um, most of which amount to really nothing. Uh, really nothing. There are some Bibles that have become very famous uh, because of their errors that they have uh, you know, made. And I meant to look them up, but I can't, uh, you know, remember them. Uh, one of them is called the Devil's Bible. You know about this one? The Devil's Bible. Uh, it, it's um, in the very, in the beginning, in Genesis, uh, in the uh, account uh, that they give of the temptation uh, there, uh, a couple of words are left out uh, that changes the meaning. Uh, that changes the meaning of uh, what the serpent does among Adam uh, and Eve. Uh, and because they left out those words, uh, and of course, you know, printing 
back at the, the, the time that this Bible was done, uh, because uh, of the nature of it, it's not like they, <laughs> it's not like they could, uh, you know, just do a rerun. Um, it, it didn't happen that way, and it was a lot more tedious. Uh, but something happened in the printing, uh, and they left out a few key words, uh, and uh, it ended up uh, es- essentially, you know, promoting Satan. So they call it the Devil's Bible. Uh, there was another one that's called uh, the Britches Bible. Uh, and I can't remember the error that it makes, but there are some famous Bibles throughout history uh, that, have, that are basically famous uh, because of the mistakes uh, that they make. Um, you know, there are some Bibles that are famous because of the accuracy that they provide. Uh, and um, oh, a good example, anybody ever heard of the Berkeley Bible? The Berkeley Bible? The Berkeley Bible is the only, the only translation that you can find, um, at least that, I, I, that I've seen. Uh, I've been told this, and I tried to check it out, but I don't have every translation. Uh, so I, I, you know, giving you the information that was given to me. Uh, it is the only translation of the Bible that renders uh, Acts 2.38 uh, as repent and be immersed for the remission of your sins. Uh, and so, you know, uh, lots of people, well, at least preachers, have that copy of the Bible in their library because it's the only one uh, that actually, you know, renders the passage correctly uh, and gives the correct, uh, you know, meaning of the word rather than the transliteration uh, of the word baptizo. All right. So there are these translational uh, errors. Um, one of the more famous ones from uh, the King James Version uh, is uh, the use of the word Easter. I don't know if it's in the latest, latest uh, revision, uh, but uh, the word Easter uh, is used uh, in the King James Version of uh, the Bible, uh, and it basically made up and inserted, uh, but it demonstrates for us uh, at least one uh, facet that it becomes problematic uh, in translations. Uh, when it comes to you know, translating certain words, you, know, you have a range of possibilities, right? You know, words can mean, especially if they're compound words, uh, a couple of different things, or sometimes a, an entire list uh, of things. Now, which one are you going to choose? You know, which one is going to be, you know, the fit here? Well, context uh, is going to be, you know, the key determiner uh, of how we translate a particular word. But every person who walks into translations uh, of the Bible walks in with a, uh, you know, a, a bias, uh, a, a theology. Uh, that um, they're going to carry into, you know, their, you know, translation uh, of it. If I am more, you know, prone to believe the whole notion of, you know, once saved, always saved, uh, then perhaps in small ways uh, I'm going to, you know, translate, um, translate the passages that I feel push that point uh, in a particular way, if I can. Uh, for instance, uh, when the NIV came out, one of the big, big debates uh, was about Psalm, you know, 51. Uh, Psalm 51, if you go there and you read it, um, well, let's just do that real quick. In Psalm 51, uh, which is supposed to be the psalm that was written by David, uh, written by David, uh, and it is supposedly his uh, psalm of repentance uh, for the sins with Bathsheba and her husband and, uh, you know, the subsequent death of their child. It says, uh, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from uh, my sin. For I know my transgression as my sin is ever before me. Against you uh, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, uh, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, and in sin did my mother uh, conceive me. Uh, and in this is kind of a notion of, you know, uh, it, of course, I don't have the NIV, um, but uh, if you uh, read it uh, in the New International Version, uh, it could leave you with the impression uh, that uh, he's saying that he was born sinful. Uh, that he was born uh, as a, a sinner, uh, promoting the idea of, you know, original, you know, sin, uh, which 
is kind of the Calvinistic uh, product that eventually leads us to the notions of faith only uh, and once saved, always saved. Um, so, you know, a lot of people base their interpretation uh, on the theological bent that they have when they go into uh, the actual translation of uh, the scripture. All right? Man. Maybe we got to stop for a minute and um, have you guys give your input. I can continue running through these different types uh, of things, but I, what do you guys have to say? Shirley. Yeah, and that's a grand way to look at it, as opposed to the other way, which we already talked about, that is presupposing the Bible's wrong. You know, I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, if you want to dig a little deeper and you want to, you know, actually have that conversation, you know, then, you know, that's what you'll do. That's a very good point. Excellent. Bill. Yeah, people got all over him about that. Uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, um, uh, fellow, everybody know Hugo McCord? Well, Hugo McCord was a you know, member of the Church of Christ, a uh, minister and uh, a scholar. Uh, a scholar. Um, and um, you know, one, of the, one of the best among us. Uh, and he did produce uh, a version of the Bible. I have two copies of it in my... Is it? Yeah, it's just the New Testament, but it's... Um, I can't remember what it's called. They released just the Gospels first. And you could buy just them. And then they, did, they had the whole New, New Testament. Um, but uh, it, it is a translation. And it, it is, uh, it's very good. And it's written in sort of a more modern way, but very, very accurate. Uh, but he was heavily ridiculed uh, because uh, he translated John 3.16 uh, a little different. Uh, what he said was um, that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his unique uh, son. Uh, and um, a lot of people took issue with that. Uh, took issue with that. Uh, but you're right. If you go look up the words, that's what it means. You, you know, uh, that, that's <laughs> it was a pretty accurate translation. Uh, and he backed it up with article after article. Yeah. Yeah, it has. Right. Yeah, a lot of people did not connect with that. Uh, you know, they just didn't see that as, you know, being the accurate way to depict it. But, you know, that, that, that just kind of shows you that you know, we get accustomed to reading certain things certain ways. Uh, and uh, up until probably that time, you know, and, and I know probably at, at Freed, uh, everybody was encouraged. Um, I don't want to leave the impression with a heavy hand sort of sense, but, you know, certainly highly encouraged uh, that, you know, the King James Version was the version you were supposed to be using. Uh, and, of course, his was different. And just simply because it was different, uh, folks didn't really, didn't really give it uh, the, the credit that it rightly deserved. Not in the fact that it was printed with a green cover. It was just weird looking. Anyhow, that, that's aside from the point. But um, I, can't, I just can't remember the name of it. The book. It's named something like the Everlasting. Yeah, the Everlasting Gospel. That's it. Yeah. Have, have they added? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I knew they added to it later on, and that's why I have a couple different versions. But, you know, as far as I can tell, it was, you know, it was good, but it does, it's a good illustration of sometimes the bias that we bring into it. We want to hear it a certain way, and, and everybody does this. I mean, if you grew up reading a, a particular version and you always study from that version, when you hear it from another version, um, even though it's saying the same thing, it just kind of sounds odd to us, you know. And sometimes it is odd, and sometimes, you know, we shouldn't be, you know, considering. I mean, there are a lot of bad translations out there, um, and, um, you know, but we're not talking about those. Uh, we're just simply talking about good translations where, the, as far as we can tell, the intent was just simply to get the Bible into English uh, in, in a very literal way, and that was McCord's idea. Uh, you know, he wanted to do it in a very literal, you know, way. That was the Engl that was the uh, uh, American standard, uh, and sometimes that makes it really, really hard to read. Uh, but uh, that's with the ESV. That that was their goal too, uh, to kind of be as true to the original wording, you know, as as possible. But even then, you know, there, there's still mistakes. There's still errors. Uh, there's still, you know, human frailties that you know doesn't put commas in right places and you know, doesn't always spell everything you know correctly. Anyone else? Who does Stephen pray to? Oh. Uh, Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Well, uh, right. Okay, uh, so I mean, are you saying that there are different uh, translations of that? Okay, well, let's, I'm going to look it up in a couple different versions. Uh, okay, uh, and the passage that we're referring to is Acts 7.59, if you want to turn there. Acts 7.59. <clears throat> and of course, you know, this is the stoning of Stephen. Uh, we understand that Saul's there and he's holding the garment and most of us know the story uh, rather well. Um, but um, verse 58 tells us they stoned him. Witnesses laid down their uh, clothes uh, at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And then verse 59 says, and they stoned Stephen, uh, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive uh, my spirit. Okay, now that version is the King James Version. Um, the English Standard Version, uh, as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Um, that one says the same. Does anybody have one that doesn't have that? I don't have the NIV. I'm just not willing to pay for it. <laughs> they, they, anything you get NIV, man, it, if you, I'm surprised they're not showing up because I said the word, but they want, every, they want money for everything. So it leaves it out altogether. Yeah. I, I don't know why they would do that. The, the thing about the NIV, and yeah, the thing the the thing about the NIV, you have to realize, uh, and again, I'm not picking on anybody who likes it, um, you know, because, I mean, it does get a lot of things right, and it has helped a lot of people begin their journey, you, you know, uh, of faith. Uh, but the NIV, uh, and if you read the introduction to it, they, they use a different way um, of translating things uh, than we typically would use. For instance, the English Standard, the American Standard, the King James Version, 
uh, and many other versions. The, the idea was you, you go back to the original language, you get the meaning of the original word, and then you just simply translate that meaning into the new you know, phrase in English. Uh, with the, in the NIV, and there are others that do this too, they used what is called dynamic equivalence. Uh, and essentially what they do is they don't go word by word. Uh, they go either story by story or sentence by sentence or paragraph by paragraph. They get the basic idea from the original language uh, and then they just take the idea and, and put it into English. You know what I mean? It, it, it's kind of, it would be like us paraphrasing something. Uh, you know, when we would say this, that, and they stoned Stephen and he died crying out to God. Is that the basic idea? Well, yeah, that's the basic idea, but I'm not going to tell you that's what it says word for word. That's the idea. So when they translated this Bible, they used dynamic equivalence, um, which means the idea is there, not necessarily the specific words. Uh, so that's kind of a flaw with the NIV. Uh, but the, the American Standard, uh, the ISV, the MKJV, uh, the KJV, the Logos version, uh, any, any version that really uh, has any kind of uh, re respect, um, you know, has the words Lord, Kyrios, uh, and Jesus, which is uh, Iesus. It's right there in the original text uh, there. So they leave it out. <coughs> they leave it out, uh, which kind of fits, you, you know, more with the notion of you pray to God through Christ uh, than the other versions do. That makes sense? But, I mean, all, you know, any version that, you, you know, uh, is considered, you know, trustworthy, or most of the ones that are considered, you know, trustworthy, they all have Christ's name in there. They all have Jesus. Joyce. Mm. You still have it? So the NIV is the same. All right. So what was the other version? Or did you read that one? Oh, okay. Gotcha. Got gotcha. you. So, yeah, I don't know. Is there a particular version you had in mind, Tim? Oh, commentaries. Well, it, it's a good question, and it does illustrate one of the points that we're trying to make. It, it's that somewhere along the way, somebody had the idea that when you pray, it has to be, and that's the key, it has to be, you know, to God through Christ. Where's that from? I mean, Christ does say, if you pray anything in my name, you know, it will be granted to you. But there's, there's no place in the Bible that says you pray through Christ to God, and that's the only paradigm. As a matter of fact, there are no less than, I believe, five or six uh, examples of people praying to Christ in the New Testament. Now, are they specific? Are they circumstantial? In other words, it's, should this be our norm? Um, well, that, that's a larger discussion. But, you, you know, I mean, if, if Stephen's crying out to Christ, um, you know, either it's just telling us and that cry is in vain, or this is akin to a prayer. You know what I mean? So, I don't know. I think, I think I saw Bud's hand and then Carrie.
Yeah. Well, yeah, and he even says that you know, he ever lives to make intercession. Sure. Yeah, and, uh, you know, as, as the Hebrew writer says, you know, he ever lives to make intercession for us. So, you know, if he's in the prayer process uh, and... Um, you know, is said to uh, answer our prayer, and we have examples of people praying to him, then I don't know why we would exclude him. I mean, if, and, and I'm not saying that's what people mean when they say you have to pray to God through Christ um, or, you know, end your prayer. And some folks, will, they'll get real specific and say, you have to say in the name of Jesus Christ to God, our Father, amen. You, you know, I, I don't know. I mean... I mean, if it's a night, if it's tradition, that's great, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but if by that we are excluding, you know, the possibility uh, of what Stephen did, then we've got a real problem contextually, you know, biblically. Uh, Joyce, let me get Carrie, and then I'll come to you. Well, yeah, it comes right down to it, yeah. Yeah, I think he means that, you know, there's that aspect of him knowing, yeah, right, yeah, I think, yeah, that was the boundary of that. Yeah, it kind of sounds that way um, until we get to the examples in the New Testament where they do things that are, that are very different than that. Uh, and, you know, never, I mean, you know, no one came along and corrected Stephen. You know, we're never pointing, we never have an error pointed out on his part. Uh, and, you know, and they're, and they're pretty good about pointing out error. Uh, I mean, you know, when people tried to worship, uh, you, you know, Saul, uh, he was pretty quick to say, no. You know, I'm just a man, uh, you, you know, and get all those ducks in, in a row. But anyhow, I mean, I know it's a big, big topic, uh, but that's why we're going to come back to it occasionally uh, throughout our series, uh, which is, you know, at least a year long. We're going to come, come back to some things like this that are more practical, uh, that uh, help us better understand, you know, what we're supposed to be doing how, uh, with the Bible and how we can interpret it and why uh, we fully believe that it is the word of God and stand firmly upon it. But Timmy and Shirley, and then we've got to be done. So. Hermeneutics. That, that's just a big fancy word that means uh, how you interpret the Bible. When people don't want you to know that they're talking about Bible interpretation, they use the word hermeneutics. <laughs> but that's, that's all it means, how you interpret the Bible. Uh, and, uh, you know, we sometimes hear people talk about new hermeneutics, uh, you know, old hermeneutics. But, you know, we all interpret the Bible, and, and there is a system uh, of interpretation. You, you know, for instance, so how, do you, how do you interpret you know, figurative language. You know, what is the method uh, that you use? How, I mean, how do you translate this ancient idiom? Um, there's got to be a method. Now, most of that is just simply logic. You, you know, I mean, something isn't, you know, what it is, you know, at the same time, in the same sense. And, you know, but that's, that's what hermeneutics means. It just means interpreting the Bible. Surely, and then we got to be done. Well, 
Well, I think, I think the New Testament teaches us that, you know, Christ and God indwell us um, through his spirit. You know, uh, in Acts 2, you, you know, we're told about um, when we're baptized, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The best place to go to is John and 1 John, in my opinion. Um, John deals a good bit with that. Uh, he talks about how the Spirit dwells in us and how, you know, we can know the Spirit dwells in us and how the Spirit must dwell in us uh, if we are to call ourselves the children of God. Uh, so uh, I think God and Christ dwell in us representatively through the Spirit. It's kind of like with the thing of, with prayer. You, you know, uh, are we talking to God? Yeah. Is Christ involved? Yeah, he is. But sometimes, you know, we say, well, you've got to pray to God. Well, okay. Exactly. Yeah, well, it certainly shouldn't be a point of division among us. You know, we may word it different ways at different times, and as long as that wording, you know, aligns with Scripture, there, there shouldn't be a problem. But great questions, guys. We have to be done, um, but appreciate uh, the input. If you would, you can turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 1. Luke, chapter 1. We're going to begin reading here in just a little bit uh, at around verse 26. So if you want to kind of turn there, you can take a look at that. And we're going to read a, a good portion uh, of uh, this particular section uh, of Scripture as we consider this morning something that is, is very appropriate for us to consider. Before we jump in, into the, to the lesson, however, I do think it, it is fitting, uh, even though the lesson is, is going to kind of uh, give honor and, and glory to, to our mothers, for us to just mention in a very simple and practical way, that we as a congregation are just extremely blessed. We as a congregation are, are extremely blessed because we have uh, amongst us those who sometimes quietly, but certainly with great strength, serve uh, our Lord and set for each and every one of us, but certainly our children, wonderful examples. And, and they give that strength to, to the congregation and we're just richly blessed by it. We have been truly and richly blessed by our mothers. But even beyond that, we have been truly and richly blessed by the women that we have serving amongst us, our, our sisters in Christ. About uh, two weeks ago, I got to spend the, the Friday afternoon with the ladies' class that meets at, at one. And, and I tell you, it, it was just such a joy. And, and they don't know it, but up until that point, I, I was having kind of a pretty rough day. And I got to sit with them and talk with them. And even though I had to kind of rush out and go do some other things, it was just so uplifting to be with these women who had taken and watched the lesson and walked into the class and had all their notes and were prepared and just ready to go and, and raring and excited to talk about God's Word. It was just such a joy for me to sit there and be with them. We are indeed richly blessed. From that class this past Friday... We have a sister in Christ. Sister Karen Neiman was baptized for the remission of her sins. And heaven rejoices. But I tell you, heaven rejoices each and every week when it looks down upon the example of the women that we have laboring among us. Today we're focusing on mothers. Because, well, because the world celebrates mothers today. But I think the world celebrates mothers today because God has always celebrated motherhood. God has placed within his word wonderful examples of what it means to be a godly mother. Has placed within his word what impact we can have on this world when we decide that we are going to walk that course. And make no mistake about it, it's a difficult road. It's not a road that is an easy road, and it's not a road that is chosen lightly. It's not a road that is without its difficulties and problems. As a matter of fact, those things can come daily. Now, I've never been a mother, so this is one of those sermons that I can honestly say, at least on the surface, this one doesn't really apply to me. I'm not going to pretend to have walked in my mother's shoes, and I imagine if I had to, well, I'd have pulled my hair out a long time ago. But it's Mother's Day. And we rejoice in our mothers and we celebrate them and just the goodness that they offer us. 
I'll be the first one to tell you, and I, and I wrote this morning in our Rise kind of blog post, that words escape me when it comes to the topic, and, and I don't know why that is. Sometimes I think it's because I'm, I'm almost afraid to say too much because I'll stand up here and, and become very emotional. Because I have a mother and my mother was a huge impact on my life. And I love her dearly. I sent my mother a pair of Crocs, slip-on sandal kind. And you know, she got it and she thanked me. And, and for her, with her feet the way they are, it's probably the perfect gift, she said. But you know, it didn't feel like enough. It didn't feel like it was enough for all the years of service and for all the things that she has done and for all the things that all of our mothers have done. In many, many ways, you are the foundation and you are the continuation of this congregation and you are the message that goes out from the voices that take up residence here in this spiritual home. And it's a wonderful, amazing thing. So indeed, on this day, mothers, we celebrate you. Because God has celebrated you. And we honor you because God has indeed honored you. I want to begin my lesson this morning by referring to one of my favorite cartoons. I don't know if you guys can read that. I don't know if you guys can read it. But this, this is Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin and Hobbes. And, and uh, it's a kind of a high-strung little boy living with his parents. And, and he decides one day he's going to write his mom this letter of thanks on Mother's Day. And so he begins the letter, Dear Mom, how do I love you? Let me count the ways. One, number one. Mm. And he doesn't get too far, and he begins to write again. He says, hey, Mom, wake up. I made you a Mother's Day card. Why? How sweet of you, son. And this is what the card says. He says, I did it all by myself. Go ahead and read it. I was going to buy a card with hearts of pink and red, but then I thought I'd rather spend the money on me instead. It's awfully hard to buy things when one's allowance is so small, so I guess you're pretty lucky I got you anything at all. Happy Mother's Day to you. There I said it. Now I'm done. So how about getting out of bed and cooking breakfast for your son? And of course he says, I'm deeply moved. Sometimes we don't appreciate our mothers like we should. There's another comic strip, it's called For Better or For Worse, and in that comic strip is a character by the name of Michael. And the comic strip shows in this one particular strip, mom laying in bed, and she can't sleep, and she's tossing, and she's turning, worrying about her motherhood. And the bubbles that appear above her head say this, she says, am I too tough or am I too lenient? Do I give too much or, or too seldom? Do I listen to what he has to say or do I understand him? Do I nag him too much? Am I really a good parent? And the final frame of the cartoon shows the son, Michael, sitting on his bed. And here's what he says. He says, the problem with grown-ups is they think they know it all. Sometimes we don't get what moms try to do for us. Certainly when we are in those younger years, we don't always appreciate the things that mothers have to do for us. The ways that they have to, to show their, their love. And the correction that they often have to offer in, in order to get us going in the right direction. And you know, we're really good about going in the wrong direction at times. Mothers do a wonderful job, but it's not an easy job. Mothers know full well, as opposed to what Michael in the comic strip would say, that each and every day they send their children off into the world that is trying to take them. They send their children among influences that are trying to pull them away from God, from godliness, from righteousness, and into things like gangs and drugs and alcohol and pornography. They know what kind of dangerous world we live in, and they feel that pressure each and every day to be the influence that leads their child in an opposite direction. It's difficult to be a mother. It's certainly difficult to be a mother in our day and age, but it's always been difficult. 
See, if you go to the scripture, you're going to find in numerous places the difficulties being listed. This morning, we want to go to just one place. Found over there in Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. We understand that the mother that we're talking about here is the mother of our Lord, Mary. And she is told that she is with child. Chapter 1, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who has been called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And with that final statement in verse 38, well, not really final. And with that statement, I guess, in verse 38, Mary begins, begins to come to grips with the fact that she is going to be a mother. Now, was it difficult in her day and age? I believe there were many, many difficulties that she would have to face. These are four, not, not that that's all of them. But Mary had many difficulties to face, just like there are difficulties in our day and age to be a mother. Not the least of which was, number one, a tarnished reputation. A tarnished reputation. You know, this is the one and only time that God is going to come to a woman and say, you are going to have a child, and that woman was a virgin, and that child is born and will be unique. This is the only time in the world that such an event has happened. So it's not as if when this comes to Mary and she accepts it as her own, seemingly so willingly, that there is some other precedent that she could refer to and say, see, this, this isn't un unusual. This isn't really any different than so-and-so scenario over here or so-and-so scenario over here. This was a very different type of scenario. And let's face it, people are people. Where did the child come from? Right or wrong, assumptions are going to be made. We know that Mary and Joseph are not married. We know that they are betrothed, but they are not wed to one another yet. And we know she is with child. Not only was such a thing frowned upon in their day and age, but it would create of that person, especially in these smaller towns, would create of that person, now, well, not just a bad reputation, but they would become the social pariah. She would be more or less outcast. You know, it's 30 years later. Jesus is beginning his ministry. His enemies come to him, and they say on one particular occasion, as he's teaching them things that they don't quite particularly like, but they say to him on one particular occasion, almost seemingly out of nowhere, we are not illegitimate children. And the reference was a very personal reference. In other words, who are you to come and teach us? You know, you're the illegitimate child of, you know, Mary and Joseph, the guy who was your father, supposedly. We're not illegitimate. Who are you? So there was this bad reputation. You know, there are many things in our day and age, and it doesn't have to be a bad reputation, but the discomfort is not really any different. 
you know, we could go into the fact that, you know, society has kind of created a sort of, in the very least, and to put the best face on it possible, sort of downplayed role of, uh, of being a mother in, in our day and age. Perhaps not as appreciated as it, it should be. Perhaps having a reputation that is somewhat lower than perhaps pursuing other things. But you see, there is this pressure that exists. There is this comfort that is sometimes robbed when we decide that we are going to enter into this world of being parents, especially being mother. When we encourage our kids, when we encourage those who are around us to stand up, for instance, for the truth. When all of the friends are saying, you know what, this is the right way. And mom stands up and she says, no, you're not going to do that. It's not always comfortable. And yet, it has to be done. Mary also had the difficulty of poverty. The fact that her family was not a wealthy family is stated in a number of different places in the Bible. Paul in the book of Philippians would tell us that he became poor for our sakes. Now, could he be talking about, you know, spiritually poor? No, not really. Jesus was never spiritually poor. So it has to be referring to the circumstances into which he was born. The physical representation of things. He became poor so that we could become spiritually rich. So they lived in this situation, this circumstance, that physically wasn't exactly the ideal circumstance. There, there was poverty. When they went to make the sacrifice for Christ being born, they had to make what was considered the lesser of the sacrifices. In other words, God would come and he would say in the law, here's what you give. Here's what you offer when a child is born to your family. But if you can't afford that, you can offer this. He sends forth his son and his son is born to Mary and they have to offer that. Because that's the offering of the poor. Jean Barron spent several years of living in a little mobile home that was pretty dilapidated. And she tells of raising her kids in that kind of environment. And one day her son came home and announced that his best friend had run away from home. Run away from home. And mom is just perplexed. She looked at the child and she asked the question, I don't understand. Isn't this the friend that lives in the, the mansion across town? Or what at least would have been a mansion to them. Don't they have everything that they want? Isn't this the kid that you say always comes with the best of clothes and the newest technology and all of those things to school? And her son answered, he said, well, they live in a home and they have a lot of environment, but not much love. Mom, we live in a home with not much environment, but a whole lot of love. See, Mary, I think, understood that fundamental lesson that most of our mothers understand. It's not about what you possess, it's about what you do with it to honor God and how you spread it with God's love and compassion. The third thing, I think, is that there was hatred for her child. I, I can't even begin to imagine how the mother of Christ must have felt when things started to, to go downhill, so to speak, in, in the ministry of Christ. She saw the crowds start to gather around him, and she began to worry. And at one time, she comes out, and she actually wants to get into where Christ is. And of course, she's there at the foot of the cross when he is crucified. But all along the while, when all of these people are making up all of these accusations, when they're putting forth their lies and they're dragging him away to be falsely accused and then eventually put to death, all of the hatred that was behind the scenes driving the leaders of the epicenter of religious thinking of the day to hate him. You can only imagine what Mary must have felt. 
You can only imagine how she would feel. But it's been something that no doubt she felt from the time that he was young. You remember Christ not long after he is born. Those magi come, right? The magi, the wise men come. And they're seeking him, and, and they stop, and, and they require, or Herod inquires of them, look, where are you going? When you come back, come back and let me know where he is. And of course, they don't come back. They're warned by God. They go another way. And so there's this effort on the part of the king to kill off the young babies out of hatred hoping that it will, in that large net, catch this one who is called king. Of course, that net doesn't catch him. But the hatred for her son existed all the way back to the time that he was probably about two years old. Now you think about that. Think about how that must have made Mary feel, that Innocent children are actually dying because a king is seeking your son. And God comes to you and tells you, you have to flee for your life because he has to live. And you're going to end up in Egypt. And eventually make your way back. It certainly must have been a difficult thing. But again, mothers of today, though in very, very different ways, experience the same type of thing when they teach their children those principles of God only to see them maligned because of it. Only to see them be out of harmony with what they're going to see in the world and amongst their friends who are trying to encourage them to do things that are very different. While mom is over here telling their child, you can't look at that on the internet and you can't have that kind of account and you can't go to this particular place all of the other friends are getting that kind of account and going to the internet and watching those things and visiting this kind of place very often and then finally she was a single mom and we don't know at what point Joseph departs the scene we Most scholars believe he died. The last time we hear about him is when Jesus is somewhere around 12 or 13 and they go back to Jerusalem. We know Joseph is alive then, but most scholars think that shortly after that time, Joseph dies. And so for the next few years, she is going to have to raise Jesus on her own. And you think that, you know, single moms would have a difficult time in our day and age. Today, there are at least some programs to help out and to get them by. In that day and age, husbands meant income. Husbands meant identity. Husbands meant a lot of things. Now, you combine that with the idea that she's got a tarnished reputation, that people hate him, that they're living in poverty, and you've got this fourfold definition of difficulty that you could match up against any kind of difficulty that we run up against today. So motherhood has always been difficult. Motherhood has always had its challenges. But you'll know Mary never says, oh, I feel so alone, I'm just going to give up, I'm going to throw it all in. Because Mary, while she understood that she had many difficulties, she also understood that she had many different resources. Just like our women of faith today. And the strength that they have. They'll probably be the first people to tell you that my strength is not my own, but God's. And again, there's four things that we just want to mention. Four resources that Mary pulled from that I believe our godly mothers today do so as well. Number one, there's a strong commitment to simply doing God's will. The angel comes to Mary, tells her this wonderful story. But think about it for a minute. I mean, put yourself in her shoes and some angel comes and tells you this. Now, granted, it's an angel and it must have been a fairly impressive thing, right? But at first, he seems to have her doubts. But in the midst of this very brief conversation, by the time it is done, she says, and may I remind you of the words, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. In other words, your will be done, not mine. It's no wonder that years later, when Christ was in the garden weeping, he said that same thing. 
slightly worded differently. Let your will be done, not mine. See, Mary had a heart to serve God. Mary had a strong commitment to doing what God says. You see, if you're going to overcome the trials that she was going to overcome, if you're going to overcome that bad reputation and the poverty, and and you're going to have uh, those other things lumped in and still find success spiritually, you've got to have strength. And that strength comes from God's will. Let thy will be done. Not mine. As Paul would write, whatever you do in word and deed, what? Do all in the name of the Lord. See, there's a reason why God says that. It's not just him telling you what to do. It's him telling you how to tap into the strength you will need to do the things that you need to do. Whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord. There's power there. Paul would say that very thing in the book of Romans. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel, folks, because it is the power of God unto salvation. The word is power. And Mary understood that. And when she heard the word, she said, I am your servant. Tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Second thing I think she had was obedience. And when we say this, we, we don't just simply mean her own obedience to God's word. She understood the idea of obedience, and she passed that along to her child. You remember the Bible tells us a lot of things about Christ. Very few things about those early years, but one of the things that it does tell us, right after the incident where he goes to to Jerusalem, and he's there in his father's house, and Mary and Joseph are all worried, and they find him there, the Bible says that he went home with them, And from that time, he learned what? Obedience. Where do we think he learned that from? He he learned that strength from mom. See, the Bible tells us, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just like we are, yet was without sin. Now Mary had a wonderful blessing of a child who was obedient. And the Bible encourages children, obey your parents in the Lord. Mary understood that. In seeking to preserve her child's life, she taught, taught him how to be obedient. There's a story that's once told about a young man who came home with a couple pieces of candy. And he showed mom the couple of pieces of candy. And mom asked, what are you going to do with that candy? And he said, I'm going to eat them. And of course, mom, being mom, looked at him and said, well, you got two pieces of candy there. You've got a brother. Why not share the candy with your brother? And the son looked at her and said, well... I don't really have to share, and I want two pieces, so I'm going to eat them myself. And of course, Mom, wanting to get him to see the point, pushed him on and had this wonderful idea. She looked at the son. She said, what do you think Jesus would do if he had two pieces? And the son responded by saying, well, I think that Jesus would just make two more pieces of candy, give those to him, and eat the two pieces that he has. But our mothers, as wonderful as they are, teach us what it means to obey. And they teach us in that obedience things like sharing and compassion and love and the reasoning why we're supposed to obey. See, God just doesn't tell you, obey. You don't have to understand, just obey. He tells us why. And the reason behind that is the reason that drives our mothers to do what they do, very simply love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Number three, she had a supportive husband. I know we just said that Joseph died, and he did, probably sometime after Christ was 13, but for those 13 years, 
she had Joseph around. And the Bible doesn't give us any kind of picture of Joseph other than he was supportive. This is the man who wants to put her away quietly, but has revealed this same story that Mary has told in private. And he decides, you know what? I believe. And I'm going to move forward. I'm going to trust in God and I'm going to move forward. And we have no indication that Joseph was not supportive or absent or, or illegitimate as a father in any way. But indeed was supportive. Supportive of her. And then finally, she had a close friend to encourage her. If you skip down just a few verses, you may remember that she goes and she visits Elizabeth, having been told that Elizabeth is with child also. In verse 42, well, let's start at 41. It says, And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She had a good friend. It's tough enough. To simply be a child of God and to grow and transform and to change and walk down that road. To do it alone would seemingly be unbearable. And that's why God places us within this body called the church, this family of believers, this kingdom. And within that body, we, we have unity. And we have support. The simple fact of the matter is, is that in many ways, well, let's face it, guys are guys and girls are girls. And while my wife and I, we can connect and we can be best friends and we can do the things that we do. It's not the same as the relationship that exists between women, between mothers. And they can truly walk a mile in one another's shoes. And they can truly share their experience and give their wisdom. See, the Bible says, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And I think we are further blessed, not just mothers, but a group of women in our congregation who do that very thing. Perhaps not even realizing but just giving strength to the body as a whole because of that she had a close friend to encourage her and she had a close friend to strengthen her mary didn't have the easiest road but she walked that road and she chose that road when god brought it to her and she excelled and rose to the challenge now, did Mary do everything right? Probably not. The Bible tells us that all sin and fall short. Do we do everything right? Do our mothers do everything right? No, I'm sure they don't. And I'm sure they'll be the first ones to tell you that. But are they deserving of the honor and the praise given to them? Certainly. Certainly as they stand in the pathways of righteousness and as they boldly do what they do. Simply be mothers. They are deserving of our praise and our, our glory. Empowered by God. See, somewhere in their journey, our mothers have said, God, I'm going to let you be my strength. They became obedient because they read God's word and they study God's word and they know God's word and they obeyed that word they repent of their sins they confess the name of Christ they go into the waters of baptism now maybe you're here and you haven't done that maybe your journey has not carried you thus far know and understand that it is God's desire and he tells us exactly how it is we can get rid of the sin that is in our life. That we too can live honorable lives, that we can live those lives of righteousness if we simply begin that journey and then continue in all faithfulness 
John in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 would talk about trials that were going to come. Difficulty that's going to be a part of your life as a child of God. But he says, be thou faithful unto death and I will give you that crown. So maybe you're here this morning and you, despite maybe the examples that were set for you by mother or by someone else, have just simply chosen not to become a child of God. Why not? Let the words challenge you this morning. Let them touch your heart. and May they cause you to question, is it that time? If you're here this morning and subject to the invitation's call, it is for you as together we stand and sing.